Amen. Was that last song, Learning to Lean? Again? All right. I love that song. Uh, Joe, is, is there a possibility you can turn my microphone down a smidgen? Thank you. Sorry. Um, last Sunday, uh, our topic was a God of patience. Uh, and not going through all of that again, but uh, just reminding you of where we were uh, last week as we were talking about how God is, uh, is patient with the world. And why, why is he patient? Why did we say that, why does he say that he's patient with the world? He's wanting us to come to what? Our word. Huh? Repentance. There you go. Uh, he, he's, he's wanting us to come to repentance. He's willing that none should perish, but that all uh, would, would come uh, uh, to repentance in, in, in his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, but the, this patience uh, we were talking about last week is better described with the English word long suffering, because uh, he's kind of putting up with a, a situation uh, because of what other people are doing. Uh, but you know, as I mentioned in the, I think the very last point in your notes last week, that yes, he is a God of patience. Uh, and, and that is something that should provide us with a lot of comfort. But his patience is not unending. There is a limit. Uh, and I think it is pretty easy if you look around the world today, if you're paying attention to what's happening, that you can see that it just feels like his patience is coming to a, a quick end, doesn't it? I mean, I may be reading the tea leaves wrong. I mean, I don't know. But I can tell you, as I look around and I study the Bible and you see things that are happening in our country and happening around the world, and if you're a student of history, it's not the first time that you've had certain types of problems. This is the first time, as I look back at history, that the world is in the situation that the world's in. Of course, you, it's like the difference between having a flood, and we had one in 1994 here, but that was different than the global flood. Right? That was a, a situation of a different color. Where you've always had localized problems. But we're having global issues now to which we've never seen uh, before uh, in, the, in the way things are brewing right now. And it just kind of feels like that the Bible every day is fulfilling itself right in front of our eyes, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel that way? I think, it, I think it goes further than feels that way. I think it is that way. All right, but I just want to say today, if you, maybe you think, well, maybe it, it isn't, but I think you'd be a nut to not almost feel that way, and I don't have to instill that in you. Uh, it, it's just hard not to look at what's taking place and not to scratch your head and go, something is brewing here uh, in, in the world, all right? Uh, so I want us to look at this morning, watch and pray. And this is a particular message that hits home to me, and you'll know why as we read through the scriptures in a minute. But looking at Mark chapter 14, verses 32 uh, through 42, it says, They went uh, to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him and began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch, keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. All right, so we have this depicted right behind me, don't we? Uh, and you have part of this verse that is right here. Uh, this is a particular passage uh, that, is, uh, hit, that hits me because I'm involved in this scene as we portray this in the play every year. Uh, but think about this. What was Jesus asking of God? Let the cup pass from him? What, specifically, what is, what is he saying? What is the cup? The wrath of God? Huh? And, and, and if his prayer had been answered in that particular part, what would be our state today? 
We'd be lost and undone if that prayer was answered, if he hadn't given that last caveat that why we put the last part right here, because to me it's the most important part of the prayer. If he was not there, the father probably would have honored what he had said. He would have probably let the cut pass from him, figured out another way, and me and you would be really lost if he, if he didn't provide for us a substitutionary atoning sacrifice through Jesus. So this shows you Jesus in his humanity when he was agonizing. Recall in the verse, and this is a freebie because this is not in your notes today, but he goes back. How many times does he pray the same thing? He just didn't pray that once. He went and he went back. He prayed it again. Nevertheless, he said though, not what I will, but what you will. And he surrendered to the will of the Father. A lot to learn uh, about that. But I just want to be clear that of what Jesus, when it says he's agonizing, when we try, this is probably one of the parts of the play that's very difficult for us to portray correctly. Because I don't know how in the world that you could possibly portray for people uh, the agony that he was going through. And not that he was going through this, the agony while he was sweating drops of blood because he was scared of the cross. That's not the deal, folks. What was the most agonizing for him on the cross was when all of that sin was charged to his account and he felt separation from the Father. That's the cup he did not want to go through. He would have rather had not done that, okay? If it had just been in him and the humanity he was operating in right, the, right there at that particular time. Now, looking at the context of the verse itself, uh, it's very important for you to pay attention to context. I, I try to reference this uh, all the time uh, in, my, in my sermon so that you don't miss the point, uh, the overarching point, and take things outside of context. But here we have, and in verse uh, 32, it says, they went to a place. Well, they went, we know where they just went. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane, but where are they coming from? Huh? Yeah, they were coming from the Last Supper. They had just eaten the Passover meal, the Last Supper. You know, so again, just imagine in the play, they've eaten, they've gone through that entire conversation uh, that has taken place uh, during, the, during the Last Supper, all the teaching that Jesus was given. Somebody, you know, I'm going away from it. Where are you going? Why can't I come with you? All of these things that has happened. They've had the, the meal is over. They're leaving. They're going out in the dark of night to the Garden of, of Gethsemane. Um, and, and, and this is where we're picking up here uh, when they enter into the garden. So they get there in the garden. And last year I was able to have gone and, 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 and probably around there. I just had, there were a couple of different areas we went into the garden. But I'm hoping somewhere along that walk, Jim, we probably crossed some of their paths or where they may have been around there. We, we can't know 100%, but we got, we, we got close. All right, uh, but I was able to spend some time. And I would have loved to do it at night, uh, but we got some time to spend by ourselves in the Garden of Gethsemane, right there, uh, touching an olive tree, uh, and in prayer. What a what a spectacular! I'm just telling you, folks. There's there's no way possible that you could go to any trip. There's nowhere on the planet that I'd rather go uh, than to go to Israel and to experience the things I experienced there. Uh, just a, a marvelous place to, place to be. Uh, but here they were in, the, in nighttime, and, and you have, how many disciples are here? Wait, no. <laughs> there you go. That's a, that's a good question. That's right, Earl. That's right. How are the, in verse 32, in verse 32, when it says they went to a place, how many disciples? Eleven. Because Judas is not there. You know, uh, he, he's, he, he's, where, where's Judas right now? He, he's, he, he's making a financial transaction, getting some folks ready for the arrest. He's not yet done that yet, right? Uh, but he's not with them currently. So you've got 11 disciples uh, as, as far as verse 32 is concerned. They went, and, and he tells them at the end of verse 32, he, he tells this group, sit here while I pray, right? Right? Okay. All right, I will make sure. Now, walk with me. Now, we try to do this a little bit in the place best we can, but in, now in verse 33, it gets specific. It says he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and then he began to be deeply distressed and troubled, okay? So at some level, they're walking along, they get to a place, they're all there. He leaves, 
All right. If there's 11, he leaves how many? Eight. Somewhere. He takes Peter, James, and John, and he says, come, come over here with me for a little bit. At that point, it says he began to be deeply distressed. All right. So he saves for those three this showing uh, of, of intense uh, uh, agony or distress. Why, why single out Peter, James, and John? Huh? John says they were the inner circle. Huh? They were what? I, I couldn't. Favorites. I, I thought he said they were Spaniards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they were his favorites. Okay, they were his favorites. Ah, you could make a case for that almost, but uh, but he did mention Peter, James, and John a lot. What? Well, as we read the Bible, and there's no place that it says this that Peter seems to have been a leader of the disciples. He is mentioned separate from them a lot by name. Uh, you know, of course, Mary Magdalene. Yeah, I gotta go find Peter. You know, and the disciples. Um, but they're mentioned here where usually Peter and James and John, and they're a group that you see a lot going uh, with, with Jesus and being there for particular uh, circumstances that take in place. So we do call them his inner circle. They very well may have been leaders of, of groups uh, of the disciples, uh, and all. We certainly know uh, that that um, Peter and John uh, were, took took some prominent roles. Later, we we'll know his tremendous amount uh, about what this disciple James. Uh, uh, did all over, but Peter, James, and John went a little bit further. Exactly how far away they were, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if they could hear, if they could see. You know, well, I, I, probably they could if they were paying much attention uh, about what was going on, that they were in eyesight uh, of him and probably could hear some, some things. I'm not exactly sure in the distance that they went. doesn't matter, but it does appear in the scriptures that he has eight over here. He goes a little bit further. He takes Peter, James, and John uh, with, with him. At that point, it says he became greatly distressed. Then we'll see him. He's going to leave them three there, and he's going to go a little bit further by himself, okay, uh, when he actually uh, starts praying. So what were the instructions in verse 34 uh, that he gave to Peter, James, and John? Because this seems to be, he gave instructions to the eight in verse 32 to sit here while I pray. You see that? In verse 32, he tells all them, so you sit here while I pray. Then Peter, James, and John, they get a little different instruction. What does he tell them? Huh? Stay here. And keep watch. Hmm. That right? Y'all agree? Okay. Now that Greek word "watch" is Gregoreo, and it means to be alert, awake, vigilant. Okay. The actual word talks about the being wake versus sleeping. All right. But it's used. About 21 times or so, if I recall, uh, throughout the Bible. Generally speaking, it's used uh, in, the, in the keep watch, be alert kind of thing. There, there's a couple of instances where it is talking about uh, some, uh, somebody being awake uh, physically. Um, but being, being alert, keeping watch, what are they watching for? Huh? Okay, well, that's what maybe Jesus meant they were watching for the soldiers. Did they know that Judas was coming at this point? So they wouldn't, what do you think they thought? What was in the disciples, what was in Peter, James, and John's mind when he said watch? Stay here and keep watch. You say watch him? Some people think maybe Jesus meant so they'll know when the, they, if the other eight are down there, they're, they're sitting there, maybe they were, Watching too, I don't know, for, for the, the Jesus. Uh, he didn't explain to him, watch for my people to come arrest me. Not yet, not yet. I just told you what the definition of the Greek word is. What are the three things, three other words that I gave you in that? He could have just been meaning stay awake. 
I think he meant more than that. I, I don't think he meant watch out, for, watch out for the harm that was coming. I, I'm not sure that he meant watch me, although that would have been something he wanted them to do, and, and more possible than the other for me, that he, he meant watch that. I think it was something just a little more personal to them, though. Any thoughts? As we go forward into this, he's going to leave, right? He goes forward, he goes into the garden a little bit, and he prays. He comes back, all right, uh, and he finds that they're asleep, right? Who does he wake up? Hey, maybe woke, he maybe woke up the three. I envision this and the way that it seems to be read, that, that he's going to where Peter and James and John are, right? Uh, and and, and he, he comes, and in verse 37, it says he found them sleeping, and at least he addresses Peter. He says, Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? So about how long was he praying? Maybe. Maybe that gives us something. He, he, he probably been praying for an hour. Maybe he was just saying, can't you keep, keep, keep awake for that long? He then tells Peter, is he talking to James and John? Is he talking to the other eight? Here he's talking directly to Peter, right? And he tells Peter right here, watch and pray so that you will what? Fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So hold on a minute now. He had told him earlier, stay here and keep watch, right? Now he tells Peter, watch and pray. What's the reason he tells Peter to watch and pray right here? He says, watch and pray. Why, why does he say do that? Because Peter may fall into temptation. Well, what, what temptation is Peter going to fall into? No, no, right, right, what is he, what is he, what is he going to fall into? Denying the Lord? For Peter, <laughs> uh, I think he was going for his head uh, one way or the other, either to split his head open in the middle or to chop his head off. Um, but uh, Brenda had said that he thinks his, Peter's first temptation was to, the, uh, to Malchus in his poor ear. But uh, here, I want you to think, uh, that's why I'm telling you, I don't think it was, I don't think it was about this, the soldiers and Judas that were going to come later. It's more personal to what Peter was going through. And you got to remember, and I didn't say this early and I didn't bring it out earlier, in the conversation at the Last Supper, he says, one of you is going to betray me. And he singles out Peter. And Peter is, he's not having that at the Last Supper. Peter goes, I would be willing to die for you. And Jesus goes, okay, Peter, die for me? No. Before the rooster crows three times, you will have denied me. You know, for the rooster crows, you would have denied me three times, excuse me. Um, and, and that happened later, right? So you see why he's telling this to Peter? He's telling Peter, watch and pray, lest you fall into temptation. For the spirit, that's the Greek word pneuma, and it's not talking about the Holy Spirit. This, this, some people try, maybe, but it's, it's talking about Peter. The spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Peter, Peter was going, I'm not going to do this. No, Lord, no, no, no. I have the best of all intentions. I'm going to serve you no matter what in every circumstances, no matter what happens. No, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. So what does it mean that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? In your mind, you say, I'm going to do it. But that proves to be, don't, don't you have a lot of context about this? Can't you identify with Peter about this yourself? Think about whatever your, your stuff is, whatever it is. You go to, you know, you say, well, hey, a lot easier to say I want to do that than it is to do it, to stop doing something that you want to stop doing. Paul struggled with that. He said the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. That's the struggle. 
And nobody, nobody sometimes questions in your mind, but it's the application of that. It's like I, I see some people and they'll go, you know what, I really love this or that. Well, that's a strong word if, if, you're, if your actions speak otherwise than that, because it's easier to say that you love than it is to actually act out love, right? So when Jesus is telling him, watch and pray, what is Peter doing? What is he trying to get Peter to do? What does, what does this word, Gregorio, what does this word watch mean for him? How do you put watching into action for him? Is he talking about his eyeballs? No. So how do you, uh, so help me. Huh? <laughs> Daniel says, help us. I shall. The silence is deafening here. Okay, I understand. So how do you do that? I want to be practical. I want to be practical. I want you to teach me what it means to be vigilant. What it I know how to pray, so we ain't got to do that part. Right, he says, watch and pray. I know the prayer part. You do it this way, right here. All right. But watching, he's not talking about his eyes. He's not talking about looking over there at what Jesus is doing, is he? Because he says, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. So I, don't, I think he's talking about something else. What's he mean? Huh? Okay. What's it? What? Hmm. Okay. What, what, somebody said something, Miss Virginia? Yeah, that there may, that there may, yeah, but he wasn't really looking at his, his eyes. He wanted him to be in a place of preparedness. How about that? Okay, so can I, can I put it this way in this English word, and I'll do it again. Can you agree with me that he's telling Peter to be prepared? So what, does, what would that mean to be prepared? And I think that's an, that's an umbrella thing. I, I don't think that he's saying, you got to sit here. And he, obviously, he needs to stay awake if he's going to be prepared for what's coming, right? He, ne he, needs to, he needs to wake up. He needs to look. He needs to watch what's happening. He needs to look over here, and his head needs to be on a swivel. You were kind of talking about that. What's going on around him? You need to be able to do that as well. But also, Peter needs to look internally at his soul. He needs to be alert about what his weaknesses are. He needs to be alert about what his strengths are. He needs to be alert about and, and in tune with what God's will is. You were saying this, Susan, earlier. What, what is God's will? What is the Holy Spirit? Be alert, be vigilant, be watchful. All of this stuff. See, sometimes when we say being watchful, we always keep looking at, we've got to read the news headlines. What's the current events that's happening? What's happening right now in the Gaza Strip? Let's, is that a piece of being watchful? It most certainly is. But if that's all you're doing is looking at the news headlines for signs like that, but you're not looking at your personal preparedness, you think you're going to look at that and be prepared, but spiritually you're going to be in rot? What was Jesus more concerned about right here? It seemed like Peter's spiritual condition, didn't it? He said... Watch and pray, lest ye fall into temptation. He's talking about what, Peter, what Peter's spiritual place was going to be at. That was his focus when he was looking at Peter. Because if Peter is, if you are number one spiritually prepared, if you're spiritually shored up and you're spiritually watchful about your own place, that's going to flow out to all the other things that you need to do, right? So when he says watch and pray, what's the prayer part going to do for him? Huh? <laughs> Keep him, he, he certainly didn't. So he, but what, what, is, what does prayer help you do? Stay connected. What? 
Yeah, so what, when, when you pray, are you just always talking? When, when, when he said watch and pray, prayer is maybe, you know, because Jesus, listen, when Jesus was praying, he was laying out there before God what, what he wanted, let this cup pass from me. He goes back, let this cup pass from me, let this cup pass from me. He had to be listening to the will of the Father because he, he, he knew this is what I'm praying, but this probably isn't the will. So nevertheless, I'm going to surrender God to what your Father, to what your will is for me. So you got to be listening for that thing about what God, you know, wants. Prayer is not just speaking. Prayer is also listening for that answer, listening for those directions that God is going to give you. It is a communal relationship between you and God where you are getting close and communing with him. And he tells them to, to watch and pray. So his instructions to Peter and the other disciples are very applicable to you and I today. I mean, I, I, we don't need to miss this. You, you should be spending a great deal of time watching and praying. A great deal of time being vigilant, being alert. What we're dealing with today in our world, one of the greatest problems across the world today is apathy. You know what that means? Somebody tell me or look it up. Means you just don't care. To be apathetic, you're just, oh, whatever. Whatever's going on. I don't care. You know, and listen, I get it. It gets this way. You get this way in church when we talk to you about, you know, the end is coming. We, this last week, I, this is the reason why we're here this week. Last week we talked about these scoffers that would come up and say, you know, God must be slow in keeping his promises because it's not happened yet, right? So when you hear people say, oh, look, look over there. Look, there's a sign. There's a sign. There's that over here. You go, oh, my gosh, all my life I've been in church. They keep, they've been saying that forever. They've been always, there rumors of wars and, you know, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and there's going to be skirmishes and all of these things. You go, I've been hearing about that. So you just walk around and you're going, ha. Ah. We just take every day as it comes. Hmm. In this verse, do you, do you think that, that who, who's, who, who would rather you be apathetic, God or Satan? He gets you to a place where you just don't care. You're not watching anything. You're just going around. And that's where all, people are just walking around in a fog today. And you have some, some people that are watching. You have a few others that may be, may be praying. Uh, but being alert, I think that is that's the being vigilant to what is taking place around you. Not just going, and, and again, this is not looking for every little bitty tiny detail that's all over the place. But you've got to have your eyes open. And you've got to look around at the world. God is telling you something. He's showing us things. He's doing things for us every single day uh, to be able to give us examples uh, of, of, of what we should do and what we shouldn't do to fulfill the scripture. You know, if you, if you have Bible prophecy being fulfilled all the time, if you're not taking a look at it, you won't know what's happening. Uh, me and Jim were talking about it the other day, uh, and, and we were over there. They have, they have everything really necessary in Israel to get the, the temple ready. They have the red heifers to be able, and I was reading you know, this the other day, that they can start sacrificing the red heifers, that was one of the most difficult things for them to be able to get. And they got the, they, they have, how many of them do they have? Is it six? Five? Four? Okay. Uh, and so they have, they just need one to get it, to get the thing going. So the temple and all of that, they have all the artifacts, they have everything ready to start getting this temple uh, 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 done. Now, if you look, if you look at this, and you, you just go out there on the news articles, they're writing about this right now about Israel. You know where they're supposed to be sacrificing those red heifers? The new, the, I, I read this in the secular news. Do you know, Jim, where they're supposed to, where they're supposed to sacrifice them? What, no, where? What particular, what particular structure? Yeah. Yeah, so in the news articles, they were saying that, that, they're, they're, that the Jews were pre preparing to sacrifice the red heifer in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And I said, <laughs> okay, I don't know about that news story there, uh, but, but if they're going to do that, uh, that's probably going to cause a problem. 
in the world today? How, how, how are they going to go uh, and, 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 perform, and perform this? Uh, what I'm saying to you, if you look out there, they're, 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 all these people, they're ready. to, And it just takes one, one move right now. Iran had one of those missiles gotten through the Iron Dome the other week and had hit the wrong place, we would be in utter war right now. If Israel's missiles had have done even greater damage, what, can, can, you, can you look out at the world right this particular moment and see that we are just on like a piece of cheesecloth? One decision, one erroneous decision by one leader. Now it's always been the case that there's people with the, the finger over the nuclear button but I don't care about Russia right this particular second or even the Ukraine situation about what I'm talking about. There are things way out here in the, in the fringes that absolutely uh, matter to the Bible. I'm not really worried about the geopolitical system for the United States. When you want to look at uh, what's happening in the world, if you want to see you know, what's, what God is doing, it's just like in the biblical times, you really just need to pay attention to one country on the planet. What is that one country? It's always been that way. You want to know what God is doing? You want to know and see where God's activity is? You want to, know, you want to try to gauge you know, what, 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 what God's got on his agenda for right now? Even in, the, even in this book, it's all about the people of Israel, isn't it? Lest we not forget them today. If, you know, what's happening in Michigan? You, you may want to pay attention to what's happening in Israel right now if you want to be alert. Unless you're just apathetic. I can't, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that every news headline that is out there, like I said, I read that about, the, I, I'm not going to bring to you always the current news. You can read that yourself. Okay, because I don't believe that every current event that happens is directly tied to something that's going to happen right here in the next moment. I, I look at it more in a trajectory period of where it's going than, than it is every little bitty day of what's happening. But what I know as I step back and I look at this, I, I'm getting, I, I'm, I probably was a little more apathetic uh, sometime before. I mean, ah, you know, we got decades. This will happen sometime in the future. You know what changed my mind about things like that? You know what changed my mind? Something happened about four years ago. COVID changed my mind. I saw for the first time in my life how the world changed on a flat dime. Boom. And I went, uh-uh. See, sometimes we think, well, this has got to happen and that's got to happen. We've got to see two steps before the last one happens. We didn't see this coming. And right now, it could just be one, any number of 10 different decisions that could be made that would put us in, ab in just absolute different places than we're in right now that we're enjoying. Spiritual things that God has, it, it's as if when you read the Bible and it says, the Bible tells us, this is going to happen and that's going to happen and this is going to happen. It's happening right now. All around us. And you can say, yeah, as I said earlier, you can make a case. I'm not saying you can't. You can make a case that we've seen this story before. You've not seen this whole story like this before. You've never seen everything set up like this before. I don't think 40 years ago they had everything ready to build the temple, did they? You know that if you're gonna if you're gonna have end time stuff happening, they're gonna Israel's gonna have to rebuild the temple. That's a pretty big thing in in in, in, in Bible prophecy anyway. If you're gonna have the sacrifices, if you're gonna do that, you're gonna build the temple. You know what's sitting right there on the there is it three of them? I'm talking about mosque, two the al and then the one underground. The Dome of the Rock is, yeah. You, ha you, have, you have two mosques and a Muslim shrine sitting where the temple needs to be. So people have gone, ah, it's not going to happen right now. You've got to see that stuff. You've got to get those things out of the way. <laughs> How might one get them out of the way? An 
what have they just been doing? Sending missiles towards each other? Okay. I just, I, I ask you in the end of your notes here, and I mean, what I've just said, most of you have seen the news stories. I mean, again, I don't, I don't know if the rapture is happening tomorrow or, uh, but here's what I know. Here's what I know. If Jesus was, Jesus has left us right now, right? He's, he's kind of gone a little bit away from us. He's in heaven, right? So let's just imagine we're in Gethsemane right now. And he's coming back. He told us, hey, stay here and y'all keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. I'm giving you some gifts and talents and abilities and y'all keep the ministry going, right? I'm going to be sitting at the right hand of the Father. Let, let's just say, and I know the rapture is the next time he's coming, but let, let's just say he's coming back for a minute and he's going to check on our state. What's he going to find? Anything different than what he found with Peter, James, and John? Is he finding us uh, watchful and praying or is he finding us asleep? And I, I don't mean just you. If he comes back, it, the world, look at the world. It, nobody cares about God anymore. They use God. Even Donald Trump uses God. If you don't know that, then you're more ignorant than I thought. They just use it. You really think that the president right now, the only time he's going to say anything about Catholics is he wants Catholics to vote for him. And I don't really know about their spiritual condition. God does. But I know these people when they're up there, Congress and everybody, what they do. Most of them, even the, Mike Johnson probably right now, he's got such an uh, important place. You know, and I, I think he's a pretty decent, was well, a pretty decent Christian fellow. But when you get up there and you get in the belly of the beast, they, you got to be careful when you go, oh, they're the most saved Christian ever been. Look out. Politicians have, have not been that great. Okay, I'm not saying they're all bad because they are not. But folks, we're, we're in, we're, you, we need to be watchful at what is taking place in our world today. And, and the, the folks that we are putting all of our emphasis on, this whole world, they do not care about God. The only time you hear them caring about God is when they think using his name or holding up a Bible for a photo op or talking about my religion or talking about my charitable giving helps them win an election. That is just it. Outside of that, even when you have people in, the, in, the, in a TV show today, when they say Jesus or God, that's usually in reaction to their fixing to hit an oncoming car. Nobody really cares. Nobody's scared. Nobody's fearful about what God's going to do and the wrath that's going to come. Because you know what Satan's done? He has just had everybody, just sang everybody a bedtime story and they've all gone to sleep. And what will happen is just what happened to Peter, James, and John. Look at the scriptures where it says here, Jesus in verse 41, returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? What's the next word that NIV says, Joe? That happened up there. What's the next word after that question mark? Enough. Can you go back? You keep changing that background. So I don't know what's happening with that. Enough. What's it say? The hour has come. He's going to say that again, folks. There's an hour coming. Okay. There's an hour coming. Now listen. It's not a good. It's not that great. A, it's not that great a thing for the world. You know. As far as like people in the world, I'm talking about like sinful people. Because it, it, and even, even for you and I, the, the, the closer this time, the closer it comes to this hour, it's going to get rougher and rougher and rougher. We're going to be praying for death, it's going to seem like. Sometimes we're going to hopefully be plucked out of there before it gets really, 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 really bad. But there's going to be some tough times. We're living in tough times right now. And this is why we need to be every day being watchful and praying and being a part of what God has for us. But again, maybe it's be 2,000 more years before he comes. I don't know. But he has given me enough sense to look at the world and go, God, I'm not going to let it be by chance that I'm just going to leave these people languishing and just hope that, it'll be two, that you're going to give us 2,000 more years. He's never told us to act that way. He, what he's told us is to act like it's the next second. 
He never said sleep. He never said slow down. He never said that we needed to rest for 10 years. He gave you one day. <laughs> Work like a dog for six and you, know, you, you, get, you, get, you get one day, okay? Uh, but just ask yourself for a moment, how are you in that area of apathy? Or are you awake a little bit? And I'll be honest with you, some of you probably look at it too much. Some of you probably are looking, you watch that news like this. I, I, I tell you, don't do that. That hurts your brain. How many times can you see breaking news? I'm sorry, Tucker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> breaking news. Same thing we heard yesterday and the day before that and all day today. You know, breaking news. Look, I'll be honest with you. You can, you, you can just pull up there, look at it for about five minutes, and you will know what the main headlines are. Okay? But those people are trying to make money too. They're trying to, they're trying to keep you especially the national stuff I'm not talking about the local people as much but people we've got that stuff will get you so bogged down and you'll think ah I just listen this is an amazing time to be alive you know why it's an amazing time to be alive because it's the time God gave us it's the time he handpicked every single one of us to be breathing and he gave us this time to watch what's happening, to see his hand move, to be able to see him defy odds all the time. It, the, the, the worst things may get, and as, as long as it keeps lining up with the Bible, because I keep going, it's, it's like he's giving us a check, a check box on there. He goes, yeah, this is going to happen. You go, oh, yeah, that's happening. The more those things happen, the more you realize this book is true. I mean, Jim said this before. This, you know, one of the greatest evidences that the Bible is true is the fulfilled prophecy. So the more you see those things going, you know the end. He's given us the end of the story. That's not something that we ought to be scared about. That's why I'm saying he wasn't worried about the, the arrest that was going to happen. I was going to take care of that. He was telling Peter, don't chop off the ear. Don't you know this must happen? The prophecy must be fulfilled? These prophecies are going to have to happen. There's going to have to be these wars. There's going to have to be this stuff. Our mission is to stay alert personally so that we won't fall into temptation be in prayer and commune with God and listen for his marching orders about how we're supposed to live our life despite what is happening around us. If you don't get to that place of comfort and solace, this year is going to be a tough one for you. Okay? It's going to be a tough one. I am not afraid. Now, I want to be as prepared as I can be because that's why you keep your eyes open. So you may want to. Do, a, do some things to make, you know, nobody's telling you to not be vigilant. If you walk around like this, when stuff happens, you're going to be caught without some toilet paper. I don't want to be caught without toilet paper. COVID showed us that. We're going to go to Jim's house. He's got 782 rolls. <laughs> I may be missing that by a couple. But folks, you ought to be a little more prepared in your material things. Okay? You should. But you shouldn't be in trepidation every day because God's going to take care of us, okay? He's going to take care of us because he has work for us to do. And let's not allow Satan to do anything to play us a lullaby to help us be asleep. He can't take away your salvation, but he can hamper your effectiveness for God. And, and, and we need to be on the ground right now, uh, 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 hit, hitting the streets as best we can. Let's pray. Father God, I praise you and I thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. And God, as we look at the, the times that we're living in, Father, and we're, we're watching, uh, Lord, it, it is easy, uh, Lord, for us to, uh, to get just engrossed, Father, in the negative aspects of what has taken place in the world. It is a scary situation. There is no doubt about it. It's a scary situation we're living in in our country. Father, to see the political unrest, the divisions that are happening, the, the crime, Father, that's taking place, Lord, just the, the lawlessness as we've discussed this before that is happening, God, just in our own country, uh, Father, and people just seem to not want to do anything about it. Uh, Father, but I, I, I pray that we would not uh, be, be nervous and scared as we're looking at all of that. Father, as we're reading your word and we're trying to be alert and vigilant, uh, Father God, and staying awake, uh, Lord, and, and we're taking a look, Father, first and foremost 
uh, our personal uh, lives, Lord, and, and our personal uh, sanctification, uh, Father, that we would be careful to guard ourselves, Lord, so we would not fall into temptation, so we wouldn't err uh, and get away from the path that you've given us. And Lord, to be looking, uh, Lord, for the betrayer that may be at hand, for that, 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 that one that's looking to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, Lord, we're looking for the enemy and the attacks that are going to be happening. Lord, that we could shore ourselves up spiritually, materially, physically. Uh, Father God, that we could be in the, the best place possible, uh, Lord, to be able to be your hands and feet. Uh, Lord, and I just pray, Father, as we do look at the signs of the times, as we are paying attention, uh, Lord, and I, I pray that if people haven't been paying attention, Lord, to the nation of Israel, that they would pay attention. Uh, Father God, and that we would be watchful and we would, Lord, ask that the Holy Spirit help us uh, to be able to understand what's taking place in our time. Uh, that way we can be ready. That way we can be effective for you, uh, Lord, uh, to reach out to the people of Israel, to reach out to the people in this nation, uh, Lord. And we pray, uh, Father, for uh, just the, the, uh, the anti-Semitism that is taking place in the country, uh, Lord, that we pray, Father God, that that will cease. And Father, we pray uh, that, that the Jews will not undergo, uh, Lord, any of the, uh, the, the types of turmoil that they've gone through in the world, uh, uh, Father God, in times past, or the pers intense persecution that's taking place. But there are some of your chosen people being persecuted right now in this nation. And Father, I pray that, that you would take care uh, of that, Lord. And I pray that hearts and minds would be changed and that people would understand, Lord, the importance of the Jewish nation, uh, Father God, and the importance of you, because they are the apple of your eye. And Lord, help us to do everything we can to pray and, and to support them, and pray, Lord, that they would come to a saving knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, because they still need to know Jesus as their Savior. Lord, go with us as we leave this place uh, this morning. Keep us safe, uh, Father God, and bring us back tomorrow as we come for Jim's Bible study at 6. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.